So we began our series a couple of weeks ago with a, a series on football, and last week we dealt with basketball, and today we deal with baseball. Uh, I'm actually wearing a jersey that's my own today. It was created this weekend by my daughter, Reagan, uh, who's working over in the school area. And uh, if you'll see this here, it says CBC uh, 2022 for established 2022. And I want to show you the back here. It's called Catalyst Bible College. Yeah, we're really excited about this. It's a, a new ministry coming in 2023. We have a lot of exciting developments. We're hoping by January 1, we can release to you all the information of what God is doing, but we're so thankful for this, and I just wanna explain to you what I'm wearing today. But we're in this series today on baseball, and I shared with you last week uh, that basketball before Jesus and Gretchen was the primary passion of my life. And uh, it was my dream to play college basketball, something that never came to fruition. But what I didn't tell you is that baseball was my first love. Uh, my dad himself was an avid baseball player, a baseball fan. So my earliest memories are memories where I had a ball in my hand, most notably a baseball or a tennis ball or a wiffle ball, playing catch or batting. In fact, one of the earliest memories that I can think of, and I, my mom can hopefully remember this, we were living out in a place called Red, uh, Redland Road, and I remember the family sitting around in lawn chairs and dad pitching the ball to me and I had some sort of bat and hitting a tennis ball across the yard. So baseball was my first memory. It was the, the primary way that I kind of bonded with my dad. Dad was an extreme workaholic. He was an extreme disciplinarian. Uh, he was a hard driving guy. And as a result of that, uh, we didn't do a lot. We didn't have a lot of extracurricular activities. But one thing we would do is we would sit around the radio listening to the St. Louis Cardinals. How many Cardinals fans do we have here, have here this morning? Oof. <laughs> wow. I, I, I thought someone would clap just to show me some mercy today. My goodness. So we were St. Louis Cardinals fans and, and we never traveled, took vacations that I can remember as a kid, but occasionally we would take an overnight trip to St. Louis to see the Cardinals play. And so baseball kind of had a special place in my heart of having kind of a connection to my dad throughout the years. And I played baseball through the sixth grade and it was in baseball that I learned a lot of early lessons about sportsmanship, how to be a good winner, how to be a good loser, and also about teamwork. And this morning as we begin to unpack truths about baseball, I wanna say something to you that I hope will help you. In this message this morning, you're gonna find some recurring principles and recurring themes that we've talked about in previous weeks. If you're coming to church on a regular basis and you're taking part in a series every Sunday, when you hear these recurring themes, there's a spiritual reason behind it. It may be that God is trying to drive home a truth to you that you find difficult to receive. It may be that God is trying to, through the process of repetition, develop something in you that's underdeveloped or something that you have little faith to believe in as it relates to your own life. And so the first principle is one of those overlapping principles this morning and lessons that I wanna share with you. So the first lesson we take from baseball this morning is that no one is perfect. We've talked about it almost every week that no one is perfect. And we would love to be perfect. We aspire to be perfect. The Apostle Paul said that he was striving to be perfect. But nevertheless, in this human flesh, we will never experience perfection. Perfection will only come when we stand before God and are glorified by him in heaven. We've shared this verse with you on uh, multiple times throughout this series. Romans 3.23, for all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. One of the meanings of sin is to miss the mark or to throw a ball outside the strike zone. How many of you have ever had a wild pitch? Please don't share out loud. I don't know if my heart could take it. We've all had some wild season of our life where we went outside the boundaries of what God's word permitted and we missed the mark. We grieved the heart of God. We sinned against him. None of us are perfect. None of us were perfect then in our life before Jesus. And here's another newsflash for you. None of us will be perfect after our salvation with Jesus. We still are going to sin. We're going to make mistakes. We're going to come short of the glory of God. And though professional athletes are some of the best paid people in the world, please understand none of them are perfect. They get paid tens of millions of dollars and you would think with that kind of salary that they would be perfect. But in the realm of baseball, which represents some of the highest paid people in professional sports, none of them are perfect perfect, quite the opposite. For instance, professional baseball began in 1869. That's just a few years after the close of the Civil War. That's, it's, it's the oldest professional sports in American history. And in that span of 153 years, there have only been 317 no-hitters pitched 
during that time. So if you don't know what a no-hitter is, that means where a pitcher pitches what is considered a perfect game. No one got on base. There were no hits in that game. Now, he did not have a perfect game. He threw balls. He, he may have threw a wild pitch. Something may have happened. But yet on the statistician's table, it appears as a perfect game, but it only happened 317 times over the course of 153 years. Think about all of the games played by all the teams and multiply that through 153 seasons and only 317 times were there ever a perfect game or a no-hitter. Think about this as well. The highest batting average in the history of Major League Baseball was from Ty Cobb and he hit 366. Now, some of you that are not fans of baseball, you may say, is that good, is that bad? Well, it simply means he was the greatest hitter of all time by being successful just under 37% of the time. 36.6% of the time, he was able to swing the bat, hit the ball, and to get on base. So here we find the greatest player who ever lived only was successful 37% of the time. Beyond that, think about all of those people that are paid tens of millions of dollars and they're only successfully batting about 25 to 30% of the time. Most of us would like a job to get paid tens of millions of dollars where we're only successful about one out of four chances. So in baseball, it teaches us that no one is perfect. You see, all throughout the series, our observations of sports have enforced and reinforced that the fact that none of us are perfect. And baseball in particular teaches us that our lives can be spiritually successful and significant if we can learn to embrace grace. Some of us have a hard time embracing grace. One of the chief struggles of my life spiritually has been this concept of embracing grace. I was raised in the straight and narrow. If a preacher preached on grace or love, we'd say, man, that's wimpy preaching. Hang us out over the fires of hell. That makes us feel like we've been to church. Come on, somebody slap us or beat us up or something. Because if we've, we've been spiritually beat up in a message, we feel like God's been working on us. We would get excited about the fact that so many people were going to hell. And yet it would be crickets when people would talk about the grace of God and the love of God that forgives us and makes us new. There's something kind of distorted and messed up about that. I came to a stark realization with this when I was, when Gretchen and I started having kids and Reagan and Hayden came along and Hayden was probably about two or three years old and we're walking through the local mall in our home area and I'm walking with my mother-in-law and she watches on a regular basis. So hi, Mary. Everybody say hi, Mary. So Mary's walking with us and Hayden does something that's not quite right and I'm jumping on him. I'm getting on to him and I'm firm and strict and scolding my mother-in-law, not minding her business, <laughs> turns to me and says, Mark, you need to teach that boy about grace. I said, Mary, if I knew anything about grace, I'd try to teach him, but I don't know anything about grace. And it was true. Everything in my life had been strict, straight and narrow, turn or burn. Everything in my thinking was that way. And I carried it into my ministry and I carried it into my marriage and I carried it into my parenting. But Reagan and Hayden became my chief teachers that helped me to understand the concepts of grace. As I began to father them and lead them through life, I began to discover that there was nothing really that they could do that could ever break the unconditional love that I felt for them. And if that was true of me as an imperfect, unholy, unrighteous man who is a father, then how much more true of that is that of God who is our heavenly, perfect, absolutely and totally holy father. So when you begin to embrace grace, you can have a significantly successful spiritual life. I am so thankful for what God is doing in our church right now. Since the middle of June, we've had just over 300 to 350 people who've been saved and rededicated in our services. Can you give the Lord praise for that? Amen. And so I wanna take a moment and to talk to some new believers for a second who may be here in the room or for some, some uh, baby Christians who may be in the room to help you understand some things. You come into this room and you see people who are here and you think that they are so holy that literally their Bibles have grown into their hands. I mean, it's, they use it so much, it just goes everywhere with them. You see them lifting their hands, you may hear them praying in the spirit and you think that they're absolutely perfect. And then you look at yourself in the mirror and you say, what in the world is wrong with me? 
Why is it that I can't live up to that? Why is it that I can't be just like them? What I wanna tell you is those folks have been saved for 10, 20, 30, and 50 years. And though you've been saved 10, 20, 30, or 50 days, it's gonna take you 10, 20, 30, or 50 years to get to the same spiritual development point as those people that you're admiring in this church today. So let me flip the script for a moment and talk to those who have been saved for several decades. Some of you come in this place and you lift your hands and you're worshiping God and you turn around and you see a new believer and you think, look what the cat dragged in. Whoa, you saw them get saved on a Sunday and you went and greeted them in the foyer and they, you smell a little marijuana on them. Come on, don't shut me down when I start preaching good. Maybe you sense they're drinking too much because it's a pretty strong scent on their breath. And you can tell that they've been up all night and they may just rolled into church because they've been doing something they shouldn't be doing. And you look at them and you think, why in the world are you dressed that way? I mean, you wear more clothes to bed than they wear to Walmart. And <laughs> can I tell you something? If you wanna get on the bad side of this pastor, just open your mouth and say one bad thing to them. Just open your mouth and try to discourage them or condemn them in any way and I will be up in your business. You say, are you condoning the things they're doing? No, but they just got saved. They're like Lazarus coming out of the tomb and we gotta unwrap some grave clothes. It takes a little while for them to begin to experience the grace of God that sets free. And the Bible makes it clear if we make even one of these little ones to stumble, it'd be better for us to have a millstone hung around our neck and cast into the bottom of the sea. So I want you to chill out and take a breath and let God do the work because you're not their Holy Spirit. Everybody that loves the pastor, say amen. amen. Everyone that's ticked off at me, say oh my. Okay, good. So when you first believe and you're a baby Christian, a new believer, you're like a single A player with a rawhide and you're beating yourself up because you're not playing like a hall of famer. And if you're single A, it just means you've got to keep practicing. You got to keep hitting. You got to keep throwing. You got to keep conditioning. Then when you become an all-star or a hall of famer, then you need to have a conversation with a single A person that says, do you know how bad my knees hurt? Do you know what I go through? Do you know that I have bad days and good days and all the in-between days and you need to relate your story to them of how you are in a process of continuing to grow because here's what the Bible says. In 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 18, it says, but grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. There is no expiration period on the growth that Jesus demands of you. So whether you're a single A player, a new believer, or you're a Hall of Famer, you've been saved since Methuselah, it doesn't matter today. You You've got to keep growing in Jesus. Ephesians chapter five, verse 18 says, do not be drunk with wine in where there is destruction, but be filled with the spirit. The verb be filled means to be filled over and over and over and over and over again. So whether you are single A or a hall of famer, you've got to continue to be filled up in your life because we all leak. We go through things, hard times, and we require the refilling of the spirit that God brings us. So single A Christians, keep praying, keep believing, keep coming to church, keep reading your Bible, keep serving. In the meantime, God's grace will cover your sins. When you mess up and blow it, the Holy Spirit will convict you. Then invite you to practice some more, but take a breath, embrace the grace, and realize that you are a Hall of Famer in the making. Can someone say amen? amen. Here's the second lesson. There's always a new season. There's always a new season. In baseball, there are dry spells that players go through where things never seem to go right. Pitchers can't pitch, hitters can't hit, injuries linger, psychological barriers explode. In baseball, they call this a slump. Everybody say a slump. When you're in this low place and you just can't seem to do anything right, they call it a slump. And as a kid, I remember going through a slump, uh, playing baseball from four or five years old up through junior high years. Um, I was always a decent hitter. But I remember I got in this one phase where I could not hit that ball if it was as big as a beach ball and move slow as a bus. I mean, I just, 
It was swing and miss, swing and miss, swing and miss, strikeout after strikeout after strikeout. And I just got deeper and deeper inside of my own head. I, I just couldn't get it right. My timing was off. I couldn't get out of my own head. I felt pressure like I'd never felt before. I was sensitive to the reactions of the crowd. And I remember I tried every trick I could. I went to batting practice. I started hitting softballs instead of baseballs to remember what contact was like. I uh, even bought a new glove. I'm not sure why I did that, but hey, I, I was trying anything I could to snap me out of this slump that I was in. But there came a day when the slump ended. You say, really, what did you do? Well, I didn't do anything. The season ended. Yeah. Thanks for coming to church today, folks. I'll be there to shake your hand in the back. The season ended. That season ended and I was so discouraged. I was beat down. I, I really felt like giving up, but I continued on and a new season began. And when a new season began, suddenly I was able to hit again. Sometimes the most merciful thing that can happen in your life is for one season to end and another one to begin. I'm believing for many of you this morning that God will begin to create a new season for you. Because God rules this earth and our lives in seasons and not in events. Everything with God is cyclical and seasonal. And God is the only one who can begin a season and end one. Ecclesiastes chapter three, verse one talks a lot about seasons. It says there's a time for everything and a season for every activity under heaven. If you read further in Ecclesiastes chapter three, a time to be born, a time to die, a time to plant, a time to uproot, all these different seasons that come into our life. And so this morning, maybe you're here and you're in a slump. You're in a dry spell. Your timing is off. You can't seem to hear from God. You're out of sync with him. You're deep inside your own head. You're condemning yourself and beating yourself up. You just feel like that you want to quit and throw in the towel and throw your glove out in the dumpster somewhere. But I'm believing that all of you that have been in the slump, that God is ready to provide for you a new season, a season where you break through before you break down, a season where one door closes and another door opens, a season where a drought is broken and the rain waters the earth again, a season that has been barren that will give way to a season full of new life. How many of the morning is ready for a new season to break through in your life today. Come on, give the Lord a hand. Here's the third lesson we're going to look at this morning. Patience is required. Baseball teaches us that patience is required. This is true on a macro, a big scale, and also it's true on a micro, a very specific scale. On the macro scale, you got to understand in baseball, it's a long season. Major League Baseball has 162 games. The NBA has only 82, and what's worse, the NFL has only 16. So if you're gonna be a baseball fan or a baseball player, you're gonna have to be prepared for a very long season. Therefore, the virtue of patience is required. But also, if you play the game, the game at a micro level also moves very slow, painfully slow. I'm not sure how many hours of my life that I lost as a child sitting around a radio. Yes, a radio. I was not born just after the close of the Civil War. I, my little town didn't have cable, so we would sit around the radio and listen to the St. Louis Cardinals baseball. But I'm not sure how many hours of my life that I lost sitting with dad, listening to St. Louis Cardinals baseball. But hours didn't seem like a big deal as a kid. But as an adult, hours are precious and patience wears thin. Everybody with me? Today, I cannot bring myself to watch a baseball game. It is not humanly possible for me to watch a baseball game. You said, but I want to take you to the rawhide. Listen, I will go and eat popcorn and hot dogs, but just wake me up in the ninth inning, okay? I, I'm going to eat a lot, I'm gonna take a good nap and then just kind of nudge me when we get to the end and you will make me happy. Otherwise, I am not happy watching baseball. Why? Because it moves too slow and my patience is too thin. Let me illustrate this for you. In a baseball game, you're sitting and watching it. 
You have worked 40, 50, 60 hours a week and now you're sitting down to watch this baseball game and you're watching on the television set and the pitcher, he goes and he comes up to the, to the mound. He looks out over the crowd. He looks at the catcher. The uh, catcher begins to give him a signal. He shakes his head and says, no, I'm not gonna take that signal. Then he spits. <laughs> then he adjusts his hats. Then he scratches. I'm gonna keep it PG this morning. Then he takes out the ball and he begins to rub it. He's got his glove under his arm. He puts the glove back on. He takes the ball out. He looks for another signal. Okay, this one he likes. Then he goes to, to wind up and he gets set and he goes to throw the ball. And very, at the very last minute, he literally jumps off, throws to first base to keep the runner over here from stealing. They throw the ball back to him. He looks and the cycle starts all over again. At this point, I've literally ripped my shirt off. <laughs> I've pulled out all of my hair. I've said words that Jesus needs to forgive me for saying. And I'm saying, for the love of everything that is holy, can you just please throw that ball? <laughs> he throws the ball. It's a ball. It's not a strike. He goes back. He starts to spit again. Starts to scratch again and the cycle repeats. Patience is required. And for me, I found that in life and in baseball, things never happen as fast for me as what I want. I found in my faith, I found in my prayers, I found in words of prophecy spoken over my life that nothing ever happens fast enough. In fact, Everything that I've experienced in life has taken longer and cost me more than I ever imagined it would. That's just the nature of life because we have a destination. We wanna get on to the next thing. We wanna climb the next mountain. We don't wanna linger in the valley. We just wanna get on with it. So what is the key ingredient to personal resolve and patience in life? It is constant prayer and the exercise of faith. Faith, everybody say faith. I wanna just quote a scripture for you from Hebrews 6.12, just to give you the context of what's going on. The writer of Hebrews is writing to a very frustrated people, people who are frustrated with the outcomes of life. And here's what it says in verse 12. We do not want you to become lazy, but imitate those who through faith and patience inherit what has been promised. So if you're going through a time right now where things are just not happening for you, you just feel like you're in slow motion. What I wanna say to you is to give you some advice from this one verse of scripture in Hebrews 6, 12 to tell you don't get lazy. God never blesses laziness. God never blesses complete and utter capitulation through inactivity. God blesses those who move. God blesses those who do. God blesses those who exercise faith. Also, don't get lazy. Don't lose your mind. Keep your spiritual equilibrium. Don't go to extremes. Don't give up on God. Don't lose your sense of self-control. Love God. Love people. Love the process. Love the season that you're in. Embrace the grace that God gives you. Wait through faith. And the Bible says that you will inherit the promise. You will receive what has been promise to you. And when you do, because it did not happen on your timetable or according to the prescription that you wanted, in that moment, you will realize that God did it and you didn't do it. And he will receive all glory and honor and praise for the thing that's been accomplished in your life. Yes. Amen. So I encourage you to exercise patience. Lesson number four, there is no time limit. There is no time limit. Many sports limit the extra time that they allow. That's true in professional football. It's also true in soccer that you'll hear about next week. They have provisions in the rules for games to end, but not in baseball. If it wasn't slow enough, the creators of baseball said, no, we'll just let it go on until you all just lose your mind. In fact, the longest game in professional baseball history happened in 1981 in the minor leagues between the Pawtucket Red Sox and the Rochester Red Wings. Pawtucket had an emerging player 
by the name of Cal Ripken Jr. that later became a Hall of Famer. I see my man out here. He's, he's cheering me on. This game went for 33 innings for a total of 10 hours and nine minutes. If Mark Merrill had been watching that game as an adult, he would be in a straitjacket, <laughs> muttering things that you don't even understand with a wild look in his eyes in a fetal position on the floor. I mean, I would have totally lost it with a game that's that long. And in the previous point, we looked at how you need patience when things don't come as fast as we would like. And this feeling is usually tied to a reality in your heart where you have a sense of hope and optimism that still burns in your soul. You're still looking forward. You, you still want to accomplish things for God. You want to accomplish things for your family. There's something still burning in you to push you forward. But what about your feelings and emotion when it's late in the game and it feels like time is running out and you're losing and all hope is gone? Instead of saying, get on with it, God, we're saying, whoa, God, could you give me just a little more time? Talking to some Hall of Famers today. You've Walk with God, seeing God, but you've hit a, a season in your life that you don't like and you're saying, God, you gotta give me some time for a comeback. You see, baseball is a great game of comebacks where people are down and out and they've written them off and somehow they get into this momentum by which they begin to come back. They call this a rally. Everybody say rally. In fact, fans who wanna cheer them on, they do something just silly. I don't know, maybe it's not if it works, but they will literally take their baseball caps that they're wearing and they will turn it around with the bill facing the opposite way and they call this their rally caps. So when the players look up in the stands and they see everybody with their hats turned the opposite way, it's their rally cap and they're saying, we're with you, come on, we can come back from this, we can overcome this, we can, we can win in this game. Come on, we're gonna stay with you to the very last pitch is thrown. We're here with you, we want to rally. I can't prove this, though it preaches better. <laughs> Pastor Jason, don't judge me based upon your series on Wednesday night. But I'm just mad today that some of you are needing to come back. And you're saying, oh God, help me bounce back from this. Help me overcome, help me win the game. I would like to think that God and the angels of heaven and the 24 elders and a cloud of witnesses turn their crowns backwards. <laughs> that we could catch a vision that we're just saying, listen, we're with you, pal. We're ready, we're cheering you on. Come back in this game. Rally, we want you to rally today. God is wanting you to rally. He doesn't want you to lay down in the midst of what seems to be defeat. He wants you to keep playing, realizing there's no time limit, that God is the one who controls the end from the beginning. There's as much time as you need that God will allow according to his providential grace to allow you to come back into a place where you can experience the victory that you're longing for in life today. If you're needing a rally in your life today, Today, put your hands together and say, God, help me today to rally. Our last lesson that I'm done, everybody can get into the game. Marco, please come back to the keys. Everyone can get into the game. Folks, uh, I realize I have some gifts in life, but diplomacy is not one of my stronger ones. The fact that you just laughed hurt my feelings right now. Just, you're not very diplomatic either. So I don't know how to say this delicately, but Major League Baseball players are not necessarily the highest example of a well-trained physical specimen. Is that diplomatic enough? For example, if I walk into a locker room of the NFL, they would say, hey buddy, the towels are over there in the corner. Could you please go pick them up? Yes, sir, yes, sir. I could walk into an NBA locker room where these guys are taller than the sequoia trees in the forest and they say, hey, are you my new agent that's been sent over to work with me? But I could walk into a major league baseball locker room looking as I do right now and they'd say, hey, are you our third round draft pick? <laughs> I mean, to illustrate what I'm talking about today, I wanna, I wanna put some pictures up on the screen. I wanna show the first picture here. Yeah. Good old baseball fan here. I don't know him, but I wanna go on vacation with him. I just, I just, I relate to him today. He's sitting there enjoying the game, just taking it in. You can tell he's got some gray hair, been around a while. I want you to see the next slide. Yeah. 
Bless his heart. Dimitri Young. What you can't see is he's chasing the guy with the hot dog. <laughs> this guy, over 300 pounds when he played professional baseball. Most sports, you can't get away with that. Baseball, you can. This guy at one point signed an almost $30 million contract to play. He retired in 2009. I'm gonna show you another slide. This is Pavarotti. This is the Italian tenor. He's holding a baseball. He could probably play for some major league teams. You see what I'm saying? In baseball, there is something about it being every man's game because not all of them are these well-developed physical specimens. We look at the NFL and the NBA and say, oh, I, I, I don't relate to that at all, but the, the baseball guys, we all kind of relate to. What is the point in all of that? Baseball teaches us that everyone can get into the game. Some of you look at this game of ministry that we're in, you say, you know what? Those people are perfect. I, can, I don't belong there. I could never be involved in the ministry. I could never be involved in a team. I could never serve. I could never submit my life in a ministry fair. Listen, I'm, I'm afraid if we're beginning to divide up sides and they're, they're picking people on the team that everybody will be picked and I'll be the last one to be picked. And I can't go through that kind of rejection, not in my spiritual life. But what I wanna tell you today is that baseball teaches us the reality, a reality that we embrace here in this church, which says regardless of how badly you've sinned, God wants you to get in the game. That regardless of how badly you've been hurt, God wants you to get in the game. Regardless of how badly you've been abused, God wants you to get in the game. How, no matter how badly you've been betrayed, God wants you to get in the game. No matter how much or how little you know, God wants you to get in the game. There is something about this where we need to realize that God has a plan and a purpose for every single one of us. And we may not look the part. We may not be the part. We may not be all that in a bag of chips. But God says, I can use you. If there is breath in your lungs, I can use you. I want to take all your pain and your sorrow and the difficulties that you've been through. And I want to redeem it and repurpose it by using your life in ministry. In fact, the only way that you can repurpose the pain of your life and the sorrows that you have been through is to lend yourself to God who uses those things to draw other people to him. And in that moment, you realize that the grace of God has saved you for a purpose of making a difference in this world. So here's your assignment. Don't you run out these doors this morning. Some of you are fleeing like it's Armageddon in here. <laughs> Don't you run out those doors. You walk out those doors and here's what I want you to do. I want you to stop. And I want you to look around. I want you to see the tables on the right. And I want you to see the tables on the left. And I want you to linger. And I want you to hover. And I want you to talk to some people and say, hey, it's good to see you today and shake their hands and hug their neck. And as you linger, I want you to also listen to see if God may draft you today where he will literally speak your name and say, listen, you've been hiding out. You've been hiding from me. You're just a fan who's sitting up in the stand. It's time for you to lay down that hot dog, get off your bull honky and get out there and serve Jesus in a ministry. And whatever he tells you to do, you do it. If he doesn't tell you to do something, then maybe you're not ready and maybe he knows something that I don't know. But here's what I wanna say, unless you linger and listen, you may miss the greatest opportunity in your life for your pain to be repurposed and to bring God glory like you never had before. So today, get out there and get on to the team. Stand with me, please, all across this place. Father, right now, in the name of Jesus, I thank you. Thank you right now, Lord, that you are a, a God who saves us to serve. You're a God who gives us freedom to make others free. And today, Lord, we lend ourselves to you. We give ourselves to you. What rights do we have as living sacrifices to withhold ourselves from you? So Father, today I pray that you will draw people in who need to be saved those that need to be rededicated, those that need to be affirmed, those that need to be deployed, whatever it is, do your work right now in Jesus' name. Heads bowed, eyes closed, am I looking around? How many say, Pastor, I'm here and I am lost. I'm not right with God. I've come seeking for answers. I'm needing God to, to create a new season in my life. 
I'm convicted. I, I feel terrible about the things I've done, the things I've done wrong. If you're really serious that God can take it all away, that God can use me, that God has a purpose for me, I'm ready to give my life to him. I'm ready to surrender. If that's you and God's dealing with your heart right now, would you just lift your hand and keep it lifted for a second? I wanna, I wanna recognize you. Yes, bless you, 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 bless you. Up in the risers, I see you. Thank you, buddy. Bless you. How many more? Up in the risers, straight ahead. Yes, I see you, sir. God bless you. Up on the left, the right. Yeah, I see you. God bless 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 you, guys. Thank you. Thank you. You're ready to surrender. Pray this prayer out loud with me. Everybody pray this prayer out loud with me. Heavenly Father, thank you for saving me. Even now, my heart is changing. Your blood flows over me. Your life rises in me. And I believe I'm changed. Keep me in your hand. Protect my life. Use me for your glory. In Jesus' name I pray. And everyone said, I wanna pray over you right now. Now, Father, I pray that people will stop being fans and start becoming followers. I pray that they will stop being skeptics. And they will be people on the, that get on the field that become equipped players to do the work of God. That, Lord, this ministry fair will mobilize and deploy people in ways they never thought possible. And that through them, you will take all the pain, the sorrow, the burdens of their life and use it for a harvest of souls that will change Visalia, Tulare County, California, and the world. I ask this now in the name of Jesus, I pray. And everyone said, Amen. let's give him a hand.